on time um, with our schedule and I'm sure more folks will be joining us. So welcome. Um, my name is Ling Becker. Um, I'm the Director of Workforce Solutions and the Executive Director of the Ramsey County Workforce Innovation Board. Um, I wanna welcome everybody um, to this um, Tech Futures event today. So it's really great to have you all here and thank you for sharing your time with us this morning. Um, if you haven't already, please add your um, name in the chat and introduce yourself. We hope um, today will be a place for both learning and connecting for folks who are attending. Um, so we are hosting as a county and in partnership with our workforce board, um, a tech month this month. And so uh, we've had a series of activities as well as a lot of info sharing about the importance of tech jobs in our community. And uh, we want to draw particular attention to the role of tech as um, a, a really a growth um, driver in our state, in our local economy. And so there's so much happening in tech right now. And with so many jobs to fill, the field just continues to keep on growing. So we want to both be able to have an opportunity to share about some of the insights into the sector. Here's some inspiration to help people think about the numerous career opportunities, especially for those of you who work as employment professionals and are supporting our residents um, throughout the county. And um, to think about how we could build a future workforce that is more, uh, more and more tech driven. So I wanna thank our partners, uh, the St. Paul Area Chamber and Full Stack St. Paul for helping us to host this event today, as well as all our speakers who you will be uh, meeting today. So on the next slide, you'll see our agenda. Um, we're gonna start by hearing some latest data trends, and then we're gonna hear from some great speakers. Um, at the end, we'll wrap up with some uh, Q&A and some additional insights. Um, and we have kind of a networking time that'll start at 9.30 um, for folks who can stay on, who wanna maybe uh, connect with um, some of the folks who've been on the call and to be able to ask some uh, more in-depth questions or just meet others who've um, been participating. So before we again begin, um, we wanna start this morning by just reflecting for a moment about the place that we all call home, whether we work or live, or have a business in Ramsey County. Um, our history and our future is, you know, uh, really critical to just sort of sometimes recognizing like the place and space that, that we do our work in. And so um, this morning, I'd like to welcome Susan Jambor. She is the Human Resource Director at um, Spire Credit Union, and she is uh, currently a member of our Workforce Innovation Board. And what she's gonna do is do our land acknowledgement, which is something that our Workforce Board does before every single meeting. Um, so Susan, if you want to help us out, that'd be great. Thank you, Ling. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We are standing on the ancestral lands of the Dakota people. We want to acknowledge the Ojibwe, the Ho-Chunk, and the other nations of people who also called their place home. We pay respects to their elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the treaties made by the tribal nations that entitle non-native people to live and work on traditional native lands. Consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. We appreciate you being here with us this morning as well. So um, next on our agenda, I'd like to welcome uh, Commissioner McDonough. Commissioner McDonough was born and raised on the east side of St. Paul and continues to live there today. Being a lifelong resident has given him an extremely unique understanding of the qualities that his neighborhood embodies, including a strong dedication to community and the importance of building relationships. Uh, he has served on numerous boards and committees throughout his tenure with the county uh, and has been our liaison to the county board when it comes to workforce issues for a very long time. Commissioner McDonough has demonstrated leadership championing um, racial equity and workforce initi initiatives, particularly to meet the needs of local employers and job seekers. And so thank you, Commissioner, for being here. And we look forward to hearing some of your opening remarks. 
Yeah, thanks, Lang. Uh, I want to especially say good morning to all that have joined on the call today, and a big thank you to all our attendees and guest speakers today. Um, I'm going to reinforce a couple of the points that Ling talked about in her introduction and then add a couple here, but we really uh, especially appreciate so many of you who support job seekers in Ramsey County. And we want to thank those employers attending who are taking particular interest in how the county is supporting a more inclusive tech workforce. Today, I hope you will find many takeaways from our speakers. One of the biggest things that I hope you will take away is the vast array of opportunities there are in the tech industry. Tech is our fastest growing industry. We do not currently have enough talent to meet our employer demand. This is gonna hold our economy back. All this is happening at a time with our diverse communities continuing to face economic disparities and barriers to employment. We all have to work collectively to ensure more people in our community find a tech career to be more in reach. We need to see more employers looking at skills and shorter term trainings rather than looking for a four year degree. I think from the speakers today, you will feel hopeful and inspired while also acknowledging we have a long ways to go. Again, thank you for being here and doing your, your part in ensuring that Ramsey County has an economy that works for everyone. Thanks, Lang. Thank you, Commissioner McGenna. Um, so to kick us off our content today, um, I am so happy to introduce you all to Erin Olson. She is the Director of Strategic Research for Real-Time Talent. Erin and her team have been amazing partners to the county and have produced for us um, research that's really, um, uh, relevant and also things that we really um, can make action around. And so we really appreciate the work that they do. Um, they do industry tech reports for us and we will link those to the chat. And so the data she's gonna share with you is gonna be a great grounding for us. So thank you, Erin, for being here. Thank you so much, Ling. And thank you to the St. Paul Chamber, Ramsey County Workforce Solutions and the Ramsey County Web for the invitation to join you today. I'll set the stage starting from the big picture. Today, our talent shortage remains one of our state's most pressing economic challenges. Even prior to the pandemic, we could see massive demographic shifts on our horizon and severe talent shortages impacting our potential for future economic growth. Even back in 2019, we identified geographic misalignment between where talent and opportunities are located, skill misalignment, and ultimately the fact that we simply do not have enough workers to fill all of the roles open with Minnesota employers. In addition to an overall insufficient labor pool, we also had a very inefficient labor market and unjust structures and processes that perpetuate privileges for some over others. And all of this was part of our workforce challenge entering into the age of the COVID pandemic. This pandemic has accelerated many of the occupational and skill misalignments that we saw on our horizon and accelerated labor force exits of our retirement age population. Women, BIPOC talent, and those who held jobs that were most vulnerable in those early days of the pandemic's impacts have exited the workforce in higher rates than other groups. And we've seen some of that really sustaining over the course of the past few years. And in summary, we have this laundry list of impacts contributing to our broad talent crisis and the impacts in the IT industry and on um, IT careers in particular has been really um, intense. The tech sector is growing in the metro and has ripple impacts across almost every single sector in our economy. So the information on the following slides are pulled together from a report that we developed for Ramsey County Workforce Solutions and is available on the Ramsey County Workforce Solutions website. So I wanted to start with a little bit of context. What are the most current labor market statistics on employment and wages in tech? There are a few components of the tech workforce discussion. So first, there are workers employed by tech companies, which include technical and non-technical employees, and that's shown by the dark turquoise circle on the left. And there are about 19,000 people working for tech companies here in Ramsey County right now. And then there are tech, tech occupations, which covers technical workers employed in industries across the economy, which are shown in the light green circle. And so there are about 20,000 tech jobs in Ramsey County alone. And just over half of those tech occupations are found in the tech industry. And that's where that overlap sits. And finally, fully overlapping with those tech occupations uh, are um, the IT jobs, which are shown in blue um, at the top of that chart. And there are about 12,000 IT jobs in Ramsey County right now. And that's where we're seeing the most growth in our tech industry careers is in those IT careers. 
the MSP Metro is the 17th largest metro market in the U.S. for net tech industry employment. And our tech industry as a whole is a critical driver of the metro's economy, adding about $28 billion to our regional economy and accounting for about 9.3% of Minnesota's total state economy. So tech industry employment overall was declining moderately prior to the pandemic and saw an overall drop of about 1.9% on average annually over the past five years. But employment has leveled off and begun to rise as the pandemic hit. Uh, so again, really interesting trends when we look at industry trends and the specific occupation trends here. The tech industry has really low unemployment at just 2.1% uh, unemployment right now, which means that there is very limited talent available for, for positions at these companies. Skills gap, education gaps, geographic misalignment, and bias in hiring systems all present barriers to IT careers. And we, we see this chart, much of the influence on this chart where we see that lower growth is due to a constrained talent pool. Uh, we are limiting our growth in this industry because of um, the, avail the lack of available local talent. Looking at IT occupations specifically, we have high forecasted shortage with shortages with software developers being the number one occupation of highest shortage across the seven county metro area. So this chart is ranking the top 10 occupations of highest forecasted local IT talent shortage here in Ramsey County over the next five years. And you can see that in many cases, there are far more job postings advertised for positions than we currently even have employed talent in these roles here in Ramsey County, another sign of just how in demand these careers are locally. Wages, even at the entry level, are high. All of the roles here offer average wages above $58,000 annually, except for network support specialists. But you'll also notice that all the occupations listed here, again, except for network support specialists, typically requires a bachelor's degree. And this data here reflects the typical requirements of these roles based on the current positions that are held here in Ramsey County. But when we look at the requirements listed in online job postings for these roles as well, we still see very much the same story. Employers are still largely asking for bachelor's degrees for talent in these roles like software development, IT analysts, network administration, and more. But there's a little bit more to that story. When we look at the educational levels of talent currently working in the IT workforce today, many actually have even higher educational backgrounds than likely required for the positions they hold. Well, about 90% of locally posted IT jobs say that they require a bachelor's degree, which is our top bar, and about 79% of all IT roles currently held in Ramsey County require that bachelor's degree. About 55% of IT employees hold bachelor's degrees and an additional 26% hold a master's degree or PhD. So we see a very high level of educational attainment in the current roles held. Um, and then the final bar here illustrates the educational attainment of the nearly 40,000 applicants for unemployment insurance last year across Minnesota. And so while this data doesn't match perfectly to identify the specific degree levels of job seekers on an unemployment insurance, only 97% or 9.7% of these job seekers have over 15 years of educational background or approximately that four year degree or higher. So we have a large share of our uh, currently unemployed workforce who has less than a four year degree. And so if a bachelor's degree is truly a requirement for these roles, um, as is reflected in those job postings, um, then we need to look at some different strategies for access. And we're hearing increasingly from employers that holding a degree, uh, a four-year degree is likely not the best measure for a successful IT candidate in many of these roles. And so we're hearing that from employers and not, but not yet really seeing that reflected in the online job posting market or in the jobs held by local talent. But a key strength here in Ramsey County is its diversity. And this extends into IT, a cluster of occupations that is not necessarily known for its diversity in other parts of our state. So here, in fact, you can see in the top bar, Ramsey County has one of the most racially diverse and youngest IT workforces in Minnesota. However, Black, African American, uh, American Indian, and Hispanic talent working in IT lag behind overall employment representation of these communities across all employment in Ramsey County. So we have room for improvement here. As we consider how to create more pathways into these high wage, stable, high demand careers in Ramsey County, we must also keep in mind the way the ways in which workplaces are changing rapidly. There've been so many changes in our work environments lately, some which may not stay with us and others which seem to have shifted more permanently. Overall, we've seen that between 2021 and 2022, only about 82% of all jobs in Ramsey County are fully on-site and even fewer jobs advertised in IT roles are on-site. Just 64% require going into a physical office in, in IT roles. 
So 18% of IT jobs advertised over the past 12 months are fully remote, 15% are hybrid remote, and 3% are, are considered temporarily remote with an intent to, to move back to the office. And as you can see in this chart here by that, the red and orange lines, those um, remote roles have been rising dramatically in IT occupations locally. So as we begin looking forward to this economic recovery, it's particularly important to understand the short, mid, and long-term outlook of these occupations where opportunities are the most promising. So the framework we've been using to a great extent at real-time talent is an origin gateway target occupation model. And this model um, is used by the Rework America Alliance and the Marco Foundation. And it's really an alternative way to consider entry-level, mid-level, and senior-level roles that's a bit more inclusive of the multiple career paths that individuals take over a lifetime and those skill sets that are important with both within and across career fields. And so here I've developed an origin gateway target occupation model for IT careers that are in high volume here in Ramsey County. Origin occupations at the bottom include roles that typically pay under $42,000 per year on average. Usually they don't require advanced degrees or credentials and are available in high volumes. So I've, I've added a little shorthand key here for your use. So HS means that those roles are high skill. They typically require a credential high demand, um, meaning that they have uh, low unemployment, high openings, um, high replacement demand needs, or high growth, um, and then high wage, meaning that roles pay, are paying over the area um, average wage. I've also included flags for occupation gaps, which are talent shortages, and award gaps for where Ramsey County post-secondary might be underproducing talent when we compare it to national benchmarks. And so when you look here at the, the middle, um, uh, the middle section of the chart for our gateway occupations. These are where those mid-wage careers paying between $42,000 per year to $62,400 per year. These are roles that require those middle-level skills, such as certifications, two-year degrees, or industry credentials, typically. Um, and, and then our target occupations are those roles that um, nearly always require some form of credential or degree. The, all of them listed here typically have required historically a bachelor's degree for entry, though there is variation across the types of roles. And we are starting to see greater flexibility from employers on some of those requirements. So when we hone in on where there's the greatest potential for workforce initiatives to build new talent inroads in IT careers, it's the gateway occupations, which rely on certificates and associates degrees for training talent. That makes sense as a first step, but the much higher wage, higher demand, and more stable target occupations may also present themselves as powerful opportunities for new entrants into the IT workforce. Specifically, computer and information analysts, computer systems managers, and other IT occupations, which includes IT specialists, multimedia specialists, CAD specialists, these all show signs of change in employers' posted educational requirements locally and are less reliant on bachelor's level skill requirements in the roles themselves. So those are places to look and explore um, as educators, as training providers, and as employers together. And so, of course, this is just what we can see rising up out of some of the labor market data available. And there's so much more here and behind it. And what's most important is hearing from job seekers, training partners, and employers about what experiences are on the ground. So I'm excited to hear next from our panelists today about what is drawing people into IT careers today and how employers are responding to this tight labor market that we have in these roles. Thank you all for listening, and I look forward to the rest of this morning's program. Thanks, Erin. Really appreciate you and all the great work that you do. We'll make sure that these slides that Erin just presented are available to all our attendees this morning. So thank you. Um, so next, I'd like to transition. You know, we kind of got a little bit grounded in you know the need and the opportunity and the challenge really from um, what Erin's presented to us. Um, I'd like to introduce you to just somebody I admire immensely. She's a rock star in the tech world here in, in St. Paul and Ramsey County and in our metro region. Um, Caroline Karanja is an innovative leader with a passion for inclus in, um, increasing inclusion and equity. Caroline is the CEO of Hack the Gap, a community-driven initiative focused on getting and keeping more women and non-binary people into the tech industry. She is also the founder and CEO of Guided Pulse, which was formerly 26 letters, an organization providing digital products, technology solutions, um, and consulting services to increase equity and inclusion within organizations as a path to retention, growth, and innovation. Uh, Caroline is an award-winning international uh, 
uh, book author and a national speaker. Most of her uh, professional and personal work is really at the intersection of creativity, culture, and technology, which I find just super exciting and interesting. So to learn more about her work, um, you can always visit hackthegap.com. We'll throw that in the link here for you all. But I wanna welcome Caroline and we, we asked Caroline to give her own personal story a bit about how she got into the tech field, but also to briefly just share about the imperative of having more diverse um, folks working in the tech industry. So thanks Caroline for joining us. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, that kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here because I think that um, there's a lot of conversation around technology and diversity in technology. And I think sometimes it's nice to have, um, you know, kind of a, a, a different perspective and sort of to add on to the nuances of some of the things that we've heard so far. So I um, am really lucky to have graduated from McAllister College. I have an English and American Studies degree, which my parents just that was so exciting. Uh, it's definitely where they, they wanted to bank their monies. Um, and when I was kind of finishing up, uh, I really started thinking a lot about, well, what do I want to do now? I knew that I didn't want to do much in what I had a degree in specifically, um, but I, I was really excited about the possibilities of being able to utilize these skills that I had now to like share more with the world, the things that I enjoyed, right? And so um, as part of my senior like cap stone project, I wrote this whole big paper on this particular topic, but I wanted it to be really shareable. And so that's actually how I got into technology is I wanted to put up like a really nice website, make it super interactive so that way more people could access all the things that I had learned. Um, and so I convinced one of my friends to like help me build up this website. And in the midst of all of that, I really ended up falling in love with technology. Just this idea that I could build this space out of almost nothing and put it out in the world and see whether or not the world was interested in seeing in what I had to say. Um, I didn't have enough time to learn what I needed to make that project into what I was looking for. But in the midst of that, I really fell in love with what technology could do. Uh, and so out of that, I ended up working for a couple different companies. But in the background, uh, I went to, you know, what's uh, sort of generally known as YouTube University and learned a lot about how to build not just basic websites, but web applications, mobile applications, and started applying that a lot with like a lot of my um, my friends and other colleagues who were looking to get like a website up at the time it wasn't, you know, you didn't have all of these things like Wix or Squarespace out there. Like you really needed someone who knew what they were doing to help you get started. Uh, and then I started building like Shopify websites and, um, and it really sort of spun out from there. And eventually when I decided that I wanted to go out and um, do something a little bit different, I needed uh, just generally kind of a break from the workforce. Um, I was really lucky in that I had accidentally been honing in on the skill that then I could actually use to create more um, financial stability for myself and have a better you know, work-life balance in terms of what that meant for me. And I think that that's really the power of technology here. Um, and I kind of want to just share a little bit of, uh, just to add on to some of the stats that Aaron shared with us. Um, and so, of course, as we know, COVID has really changed what the workforce looks like. Um, but, you know, it's made everything a lot more virtual. Uh, it's one of the things that it's done that I feel like oftentimes isn't talked about is that it's made us rapidly move towards automation. Right. So like warehouses are more automated, even the way that you order food in a lot of restaurants, even here locally, like they've just gone a more automated route. So that means that there's less staff, um, there's less job openings in some of those places, even though there's still a worker shortage in those sectors. Um, and so what how how this has impacted is like a lot of people who held those jobs, a lot of them tended to be disproportionately Black and Latinx and women. Um, all those people now also don't have um, stable job potential going forward because automation has become such a norm. Um, and so there is this concept known as like a triple jeopardy worker. And a triple jeopardy worker is someone who has a job that is low wage and thus has less potential for income stability, um, let alone a living wage. Uh, it's an essential job. And it's also a highly automatable job. And according to some statistics, and I can share um, the links to all of this later, but Accenture did a study and there is over 350,000 jobs or 350,000 workers 
between St. Paul and Minneapolis that are in this triple jeopardy area, right? Um, and so that means that those jobs have a much higher chance of being automated. And those are um, occupations in the food services and retail and manufacturing um, and warehouse, some of those uh, positions that we are really moving a lot more towards having robots and other things um, do a lot of that work. And so as you can imagine, a lot of those jobs, as I mentioned, are being held by people who belong in certain populations who, of course, have already disproportionately been um, pushed out of the workforce in certain ways and out of that income stability. Uh, and even as Aaron mentioned, we have a pretty low unemployment rate. Um, you know, in February, for example, it was 2.7. Um, that was the Minnesota's unemployment rate, which I know is different from Ramsey County, but the black unemployment rate was 6.5%. So we're still seeing this proportionality in terms of who is getting access to some of these new positions. And that is a key part in terms of like where the biggest potential really lies in addressing our worker shortage, which is a lot larger in the tech sector than it is in other areas. Um, for example, so these jobs that are more resilient to automation have higher wages and have intense growth potential, as in they have they are projected to have a very positive job growth within the next you know five years or so. You know we're talking about well over two hundred and thirty thousand positions that that has right. So when you do the math, you can very easily see like okay, if we can get people who are in these higher automation positions over to these other jobs, then there is like a real potential there for um, ensuring a more equitable economic system here in the Twin Cities. And as was mentioned, a lot of those jobs really lie in the technology sector. And so I, th I think that's a number one reason for why tech, like why we should be pushing this as um, a real potential for people who are interested on it. And there are other jobs too that have lower lower um, automation potential, but this is a pretty big one. I think the other reason too is just like tech is everywhere, right? So as I mentioned, you know, some of the people that I was building websites for are were poets. Um, and now as a poet, in order to really make it, like you need a solid Instagram, you need a solid social media, which means that you need to understand digital marketing and digital analytics in order to grow. Uh, you need to, you know, depending on sort of how you wanna go with things, having a solid website, being able to kind of really think through what your digital presence is. Like all of that means is that technology is embedded in everything. I went to a restaurant yesterday and in order to get our, um, our server to come back and you know give us water or whatever, we had to push a button and the person had like a wrist on their uh, thing on their wrist that let them know, oh, this table needs you, right? And so even in all of these other jobs, like there are ways in which technology is being embedded, which then brings me to the my third and last point as to why technology, which is that um, you know, we saw kind of a really great list of here are all the different um, tech positions that are open and here's their salary and all that stuff. But the amazing thing about technology is that it's a totally new world and COVID has completely altered what we even thought technology was and how quickly it could be adapted. Tech is a world with unknown potential, right? It's a world with um, unlimited job descriptions and job titles. And it's a world in which we don't even know the ways in which its tentacles are going to go and reach into sort of the depths, good or bad, right, of our day-to-day -day lives. And I think that good or bad is key, but that's a different conversation. Um, and so with tech being so broad, it means that there's so much opportunity for how we talk about ways in which people can enter technology. You know, if someone wants to be, um, if someone is really into like doing nails, for example, right? Like how can they use technology to grow their business in that way? And they'll need technology in order to make that business really grow. Like that's just the world that we're in. And so because of that, it offers opportunity for entrepreneurship, right? So what if we thought of entrepreneurship as like a key concept in terms of how we think about technology? Um, it means that people who are interested in working in the corporate sector, that is a completely amazing path for those individuals, right? It means that for people who are interested in creating you know, social impact solutions, like technology is a way of being able to do that. Um, you know, there's this whole other world where we're talking about Web3, right? And that's the metaverse and um, crypto and all of these are blockchain, right? There's all of these other potential. And that's what I mean by like, it is unknown and it's, and it's just ability to create all of these new opportunities. And so even the descriptions, the titles that we are putting and tying to certain, you know, um, wage salaries and job descriptions and growth potential, it doesn't even touch on, we're going to look back on this list in five years and be like, 
whoa, we were so off. But the one thing we were definitely on point on is that technology is a key part of our world moving forward. And thus, it's a key part in us understanding what equity looks like within Ramsey County. We cannot have equitable systems and we cannot have um, good wages and stable economic um, workforce and ecosystem unless we tie technology into that. And so the last thing I'll just kind of leave with is that if we think about our workforce as kind of this um, big uh, circle, right? So let's, let's stick with the pie analogy. If we think of it as sort of like this big pie and every single position is listed on this pie, right? So I would put out like a really towards the middle, I would put out sort of a large slither and I would put tech all around it, right? And so how do we really encourage people if they're interested in, um, if they're interested in like healthcare, you know, what is a sector, how does technology intersect there, right? And like, that's a biggie, right? Like all of these different things, there are ways in which technology intersects. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, when we, when we kind of look at the way that we're thinking about workforce solutions in that way, it becomes really easy to create something that is sustainable. Um, and so I wanna share with you all really quickly, a model that we use um, over at Hack the Gap and the way that we think about how to inspire people towards tech, right? So at Hack the Gap, we're focused on getting and keeping more women um, and non-binary people with a particular focus on uh, individuals who identify as Black, Indigenous, um, people of color, Latinx, and technology. Um, and so we see that the major problems around technology are how do you inspire people so that way they can, um, so that way they can kind of how do we reach out to individuals, right? Um, how do we grow those individuals in terms of upskilling and reskilling them around technology? And again, taking the things that they're passionate about and then interested in and seeing the ways in which those things are tech enabled so that way they are better suited for that field's growth. Uh, Cause we know it will, it will involve technology. And then how do we connect those individuals with opportunities? Um, and our solution is really straightforward. It's about, it's very much based on, you know, not only my experience and how I got into technology, which is just wanting to share the thing that I was excited about, um, but then also in the way that a lot of people really more organically get into tech. Um, I found that the people who are most passionate got into this field because they were curious about something and, and that's really what's um, what led them there and also what kept them there. And so we're really interested in using events like hackathons to inspire people, to bring them together and to have them learn something new and interesting and engage. And so those hackathons, part of it is about, you know, sort of building confidence. Part of it is about building a, a new skill set around a new technology. And also it's really about meeting other people who look like you, who might think like you, who may not, and interacting with them and building community in that way. And then after those events and those um, those hackathons, then we really focus on like, how do we help individuals engage and continue to develop around that skills or the things that they're really interested in. So that might be through our social media and some of our guides that might be through more formal training. But then lastly, you know, how do we help them take what they've learned and activate it within the space that they want to be in. So again, if that's within a corporate sector, if that's been within their own entrepreneurship, or if that's just connecting them with other resources where they can continue to grow. Um, um, that is completely within the things that we want to see continue to happen and develop in the space. Um, so with all of that shared, you know, I hope that one of the things that will start to embed more in these conversations around technology is this other whole future around it. And so especially as we're talking to younger people, you know, those individuals are going to be facing a different job market than we are currently. But because of this constant, um, there's a way in which their future looks a lot different. And so we just have to make sure that everyone has access to those tools and those resources. That way the conversation can be a lot more different than it is today. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. That was amazing. I feel like that was my uh, caffeine boost for the morning that I needed. So it was really inspiring. Thank you. Well, next we're gonna switch to our panelists. And um, just to save a little time, Rather than me doing um, a big introduction, I just really would love for each of you, um, Christy, Garth, and Cassie, to just take a few minutes and just tell us about um, your role at your organization and tell us a little bit about what you do, and then we'll just dive in. So if that's all right, I think that might be the fastest way to get you all introduced is for you to uh, speak to it yourself. So would you, um, how about, um, Christy, would you please help us start? 
Can we just listen to Caroline all day? <laughs> That's just amazing. And Erin, thank you so much. I'm always so amazed at the data that you pulled together. So thank you so much for having me. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Christy Larson. I'm the Director of Employer Partnerships at Prime Digital Academy. Uh, I Prime Digital Academy, for those of you that don't know, we are based here in Minneapolis um, and we are a school. We're an immersion school for folks looking to break into tech. We have two different tracks. We have a full stack software engineering track, and then we have a user experience design track. Um, so those are kind of our two, our two main focus areas, but uh, I'm happy to share tons more about all of that, but I will, um, you know, in for sake of time, like Ling said, we will kind of dive in. My role really is surrounding a variety of different areas. So I focus uh, with the students while they're in the classroom on career development. So we talk about things like networking and LinkedIn and resumes and cover letters and all things uh, kind of related to the direction that they're looking to go um, and taking their previous. So a lot of our students are career changers or the majority of them are career changers. So I think really we're at a bell curve about 25 to 40 years old is where the majority of our students are coming, uh, coming, coming at age wise. Um, but yeah, so I focus on career development and then also kind of on the flip side, we have a mentorship program. We have guest weekly guest speakers. Um, we source pro bono client projects for our students. So they get some real world work uh, before they leave the program. So I focus a little bit on engaging folks in that space. And then really a lot of my work uh, is with alumni and, and those folks that are job seeking, but also those folks that are just looking for information on how to level up or how to gain some leadership skills or how to negotiate a new salary. So I kind of have a, a unique perspective across the board from Prime. I've been with Prime for, oh gosh, almost six years now. Uh, Prime started in 2014. So I've kind of seen the amazing growth and um, the, the partners that we've brought on and you'll hear from, from some of them today, um, but really excited to be here. So I will pass it on to maybe Garth. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, and, and Caroline, fantastic job. Uh, great information. Love hearing from you. Uh, thanks everybody for letting letting me participate in this. So my name is Garth Mueller. I've been with Travelers Insurance Company for 29 years, right out of college. Um, my role at Travelers is as a hiring manager in technology. I am searching and and looking for. Uh, early in career candidates, mid-level candidates, and experienced can candidates across the board. I lead a team of um, 60 software engineers, and we work in an area of travelers that supports the business called Premium Audit. Um, along with you know, those responsibilities, I, I like to participate in other diversity initiatives and other things that the company does uh, uh, within the city. So it, it's a pleasure being part of Ramsey County here in downtown St. Paul. Pleasure being with St. Paul, the city of St. Paul, for, for this many years that I've been in my career. Um, I partnered with Christy. She mentioned that uh, some of us will be speaking. I, I uh, can't say enough about Prime Digital Academy from my particular experience. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity for uh, people with different experiences that want to leap into the technology arena um, that maybe don't have that degree. Maybe they do have a degree and they just want to you know, move into technology. So um, I think here at Travelers, we've hired around uh, between 20 and 30 Prime Digital um, graduates. And Christy probably has the specific stats that maybe she can share with us later. But um, for that, I'll just uh, leave it leave it there, and we can talk more in a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Garth. Um, Cassie, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah. Hi, my name is Casey Siekman. Um, I'm currently an engineering team lead over at Suna, um, which is a local startup located here in Minneapolis. They also have a studio um, in Denver, Seattle. And Austin and our focus is fast casual content making photo shoots and just like professional photography videography available for the masses uh, so you don't have to go searching for a photographer and an art director and a place to shoot we have it all there for you with video, uh, photos starting at $39 and videos at 93 so really making it super accessible for all um, and so just a little bit about my journey I actually was in the very first cohort at Prime Digital Academy that's where I learned how to code I have a degree in communications and journalism from the U of M um, and just wasn't finding success in that area and uh, knew about the nerdery and heard about Prime and went there 
worked there for a little bit, went out into the real world, was a consultant for a while, went back to work at Prime as an instructor, and now I'm here um, at SUNA where I've really been able to kind of level up my just professional skill set and coding skill set. Um, so I don't know what else I can add right now. I think we have lots of questions to get to, yeah. so I'm going to leave it at that, but I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, thanks, Casey. So, Christy, let's start with you. Do you know what what's kind of what what's what are your pulse on what's happening? I mean, are there a lot of people signing up for you know opportunities? Are you know what's drawing people? What might be hurdles people have to committing to training through Prime? Yeah, all great questions, and we could probably spend an entire day on all yeah. of those things. Um, so yeah, I mean, we have we definitely have seen. Over the, the course of the pandemic, for sure, we have seen an uptick in folks coming in from healthcare, education, uh, the entertainment industry, right? A lot of folks that maybe were thinking about making a change, but didn't really want to take the leap without, you know, our programs are full time. So most of our students are not allowed to work um, or they're allowed, but they're not able um, to work while they're in the program just simply because the time frame just doesn't allow for it and so for a lot of folks it was that was the barrier right not having that income during the time that they were enrolled in the program and so for sure since the pandemic we've seen kind of an uptick in in folks coming in from those spaces um but our our programs have remained steady i mean i will say you know, from pre-pandemic to to now, we've really seen uh, full cohorts coming through. Our cohorts are 20, 20 folks in size. So, you know, typically seeing full cohorts coming through. We've altered and done a couple different things. We are now fully back on campus with the majority of our cohorts, but we are offering a part-time program uh, that is, you know, um, allowing folks that maybe couldn't quit their job or aren't, you know, able to financially uh, leave the workforce uh, to kind of upscale in the evenings with us. So we've taken our curriculum and just delivered it over a longer period of time in the evenings. We've also partnered with the city of St. Paul Bright Track program in Minneapolis and MSP Tech Hire uh, to offer a program for, um, uh, I call them kids. That's just because maybe I'm getting old, but they're not kids. They're 18 to 24 year olds uh, from the BIPOC community that are looking to break into uh, user experience design. So we're offering a shorter program for them uh, that is giving them kind of that, that real world client work. So we're really trying to make things a little bit more accessible. Um, we have some different funding opportunities for folks so that you know they're able to, to access different ways to get either educational loans or ISAs, or um, we have some internal scholarships that we offer as well. So there's a lot of things that we're trying to do to, to really make it accessible to everyone because we understand that, you know, unfortunately not everyone has has access to, to the funds to do the upskilling that they want to do. And like Caroline said, a lot of those folks are, you know, doing it on their own, which is fantastic. But often, you know, it's uh, hard to break in and, and build that that portfolio, if you will, um, in some of those spaces. So we we've been very very blessed uh, and and continue you know to to do what we can to make things as easy uh, or as less of a barrier to entry as we possibly can into the tech industries. So yeah, thanks, Christy. Um, Casey, I was just gonna maybe start with you know next question with you as a graduate. You know, what are you? I, you know, I think you shared a little bit about your journey already, but you know, what do you think are the qualities that make a tech professional successful, you know, and have you seen other folks, it sounds like you had a four year degree coming from communications, but I'm just curious, like, have you had, um, you know, rub shoulders with other colleagues that don't have a four year degree, like, are, you know, what kind of what are the skill sets that people are bringing to the marketplace? And, and is it, you know, it, all things being equal, like, it, does it still work, you know what I mean, without a four year degree with the colleagues or other even professionals you've met in the in the community? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I have a unique perspective now coming from Prime, working at Prime with these students going through and now being a hiring manager at SUNA, where I had, we have a, a lot of Prime graduates uh, at working at SUNA. I can't remember what the number is now. We have like six, it's probably half of our team right now. Um, and then also just for our, our most recent uh, hire that I, I was in charge of, we had I think four four people in the in round two and two of them were prime graduates and and two people in the final round and one of them was a prime graduate and in the very first round it was probably half 
of prime graduates. And so from like a hiring manager perspective, it does make it a little bit easier because like if you see a four year degree, it gives you just a smidge bit more insight into this person's background, lets you know if they have experience, especially in something else like I have, we just hired somebody that has an experience like a background as a linguist. Um, which we were just like, that's super interesting. And I think that that would totally be a fun addition to our team. Or we hired um, like a UXer that has like background in psychology, which I think is gonna be such a huge, uh, you know, addition to her journey as uh, a UXer. Um, so the college degree is something that just like gives you a really quick snapshot as to like what else this person might be bringing if it's not computer science. Um, but it takes a little bit more work on the, the part of the hiring manager to be able to dig in and look for those extra little nuggets of information in a resume that might not contain a four-year degree. So looking at those previous experiences, those previous jobs, and understanding that every piece of a person's history is what makes them who they are and what is going to make them a really fantastic employee. If they're coming from retail, they're able to deal with clients directly. They're able to problem solve on the fly. They're able to communicate. They're able to maintain composure, hopefully, in stressful situations. Um, if they're baristas, maybe they have a really good uh, memory for remember, like they are be able to remember people's orders and make them feel at home when they come in. And they're able to really understand how different people like to be communicated with. Um, and so it's a lot of these other quote unquote soft skills that people gain from other experiences that will contribute to their success in the tech field. I, I always say I'm a very mediocre coder, but I'm really good at communicating. I'm really good at organizing. And that is what has really led to my success, especially at Suna being able to go from an SE2 to a senior to a team lead in less than a year is because I have the passion, I think is a huge part of it, demonstrating that passion. Like you wanna learn, you wanna try things out. You are probably always in a little bit over your head, but that is part of what gives you that fire. And then just taking advantage of the opportunities that are laid in front of you and communicating. I think that communicating is such a huge piece that people don't think of when they get into the tech industry. Cause you think of somebody coding alone in their basement and, this is the most communicative job I've ever had. I've never talked to people so much. And I worked in retail, I've worked in the food industry and I talk to people nonstop now because it's just required to let your manager know what you're working on to help those, the, the junior level devs, bring them up to your level, communicate with them, share that information. Um, and so for me, coming from Prime, that's what help, has helped me succeed. And then when I look at applications, those are the things that I look for. Um, so a college degree is nice if you are looking for, if you, you're just like scanning a resume and it's just like, oh, cool. That's an indicator that they can follow instructions, jump through hoops. They have this other interest that's kind of like giving a little bit more information to their history, but you just got to, on the managing, the hiring manager's role, you just got to dig a little deeper and say, what else is there? What else can I find out about this person that doesn't come from a four-year degree? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I always tell prime students too. I'm like, list all of that history. I want to know about it. That's the thing that really turns me away is like, if there's just no history, because then it just requires a little bit more effort on my part to reach out and try I didn't get it, which I still will do if I need to. Uh, but if other people are providing me with that information, those are the people I'm going to be moving forward with because I know that they have this interesting history that's going to contribute to them being a successful uh, engineer. Hopefully that wasn't too all over the place. There's just no, so many it things. Was wonderful, <laughs> Casey. I mean, I, I'm so hopeful for our community if we have more people in hiring roles thinking with the mindset that you're thinking. So Garth, I saw you nodding your head a bit. Love for you to expound a little bit about, you know, what Casey was saying too, as somebody who recruits and looks for talent. Um, but I'll give you a two-part question. I mean, I'd love for you to do that, but also, you know, um, I, I sent out to all of you this article that was in the Wall Street Journal around blue collar to um, tech jobs and, and whether or not, you know, that college degree is needed. And, 
And Garth, you work for a large employer and, and, and you know, are you seeing the ability to make that kind of change? And, and, and will it behoove our employers that want to kind of get ahead of the curve in this tight job market to be the leaders to do that instead of be kind of stuck here? I mean, Aaron's data, what I love about it is it is real time and it sort of holds everybody accountable to, you know, what those job postings really say. So Garth, that's a lot, but maybe you can roll some of your comments into some of those uh, thoughts. So thanks. Yeah, absolutely, Ling. <clears throat> um, Casey had a lot of great things to say, and I agree with with everything that she had to say. You know, recruiting from Prime for a while here, I see a lot of those same things that Casey highlighted. Um, your point about Travelers being a large corporation, and what are we doing? What has changed at Travelers, you know, these days in order to to compete? We all know that the job market for for anybody hiring is really challenging. Um, you have to be fast. You have to have, be efficient within your organization. You have to be able to make quick decisions on identifying that talent and, and bringing them in quickly. So we have eased up a little bit on our degrees, you know, requiring a four-year degree. We don't require a four-year degree if you have boot camp experience or you have your technology experience. Um, to some of Casey's points about the four-year degree and what that, how that helps as a hiring manager, I would agree. Um, that <clears throat> the more information that we can see um, about the, the candidate's history is great. And understanding what that degree was and what they've done within that degree when they achieved that degree is, is outstanding too. But what I like to look at when I'm, you know, personally as a hiring manager, when I'm screening a lot of candidates is what have they done to show initiative? What have they done to show independence? What have they done to show um, their ability to, you know, we've heard a lot, think outside the box, um, but that's what we're looking for in candidates. Um, you know, I have a large team and I'm trying to find individuals that will bring diversity in thinking as well and how they approach the problems that we're trying to solve. So as I'm looking through um, resumes and trying to determine, you know, is this candidate we want to bring through? And again, we have to, we have to do this quick. We have to be efficient because the ones that are talented, the, the talent that's out there is getting swooped up very quickly. So I can't tell you how many times that, that I've been too late to the game, so to speak, and, and the top talent has gone somewhere else. Um, Casey mentioned linguistics a little bit ago. We had a fantastic candidate that had military ex experience, spoke six different languages, um, was a, a, a prime participant. And so um, I bring that up because from the military aspect, we've been doing a lot of recruiting from uh, military as well. Uh, this particular candidate jumped out to me because of her background and what she did in the military. She was at Prime getting the boot camp experience now, um, applying what she learned in, in the military to technology uh, and was just a fantastic candidate. Unfortunately, we weren't able to, to bring her into Travelers, but uh, maybe next time on a similar candidate. So one of the things I also want to highlight is, you know, what, what's working these days for us um, we're trying a lot of different things. We do um, co-ops, we do internships, you know, we recruit at the boot camps. The boot camps really resonate with me because when I started and I mentioned 30 years ago and I did have a degree, came out of college, but we had an internal boot camp at the time. So I got hired into the company, but that was built exactly like, not exactly, but very similar to what Prime does today. Um, so for me, it, it really resonates and, and I like that. Um, I think we get great candidates. We've hired chefs, we've hired former electricians, we've hired bartenders, we've hired teachers, and I mentioned military. There's just a whole plethora of different previous skill sets that apply to technology these days. Um, and it's just, it's an exciting time. So Ling, I'm sure I missed some of your questions. Uh, what, what else can I expand that? Yeah, no, I think it was great. I mean, I think you guys have all demonstrated that, you know, there's an opportunity and a challenge here in our community. And it's a, uh, it, there's mindset changes that have to happen on both sides. I think job seekers have to be able to rethink how to present themselves and to be able to throw that out forward, take the step forward, look into some of these, you know, opportunities for training, but we want to make sure that the employers are also doing that 
extra diligence that, you know, you and yeah, Garth, you and Casey talked about. I mean, I think this makes me really hopeful, actually, is what really what I walk away from. I, you know, we only have five minutes and I know I didn't do your, this panel justice at all, but may, I do want to make sure if anyone is in the audience that has a burning question that maybe we take that um, over. Otherwise, I'll have a last question, but let's just see if does anyone have a question that you're burning to ask? You could either unmute yourself or share it in the chat. Anybody waiting for a question? I did see one question pop up in the okay. chat. Travelers internships. And if we take friends yeah. from all ages, uh, <clears throat> it's a great question. Um, I'd have to probably look into that further. Uh, our internships right now, admittedly, are traditional coming out of um, college and, and those types of programs. But if you're interested, um, go out to travelers.com slash careers and you will see all of the different types of, of opportunities that we're providing out there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating me how much like, you know, employers have to continue to rework their systems at this time. You know, we at the county as an employer, same thing, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of thinking that has to go through about how we all collectively try to build an economy that really works for folks that, you know, you know that, that four-year degree, while it does indicate a lot of things, was not, it has not been accessible for a variety of reasons to a lot of people. And that doesn't necessarily mean they can't, we don't need them. You know, we can't have them sit on the sidelines. So I guess I'll just end with, you know, um, you know one quick round for all of you. You know, if you were gonna kind of leave a, a parting statement for someone who, you know, has never delved into this tech industry, you know, what would be your one piece of advice? You know, just like, what would be, well, you know, just, you know, you're thinking about it. It's an opportunity you have it. You need a career change. You need a career opportunity. What, what would be the best piece of advice you could give them? So um, Caroline, let's start with you. We haven't heard from you since the opening, so. Yeah, I think the one thing I would say is uh, you can always try out all these things for free or for much, much cheaper first. So I would uh, urge people to just go on YouTube and Google what you're interested in. Um, take a look at signing up for things like Team Treehouse or Coursera, which is available for a lot of people for free um, and test it out there first and see exactly what you're interested in. So that way, if you end up doing something like a boot camp, you have a little bit of familiarity in what you you can dive in a little bit and be more specific about what you want to do next. So lots of free resources, use them all. Oh, that's great. Uh, Christy? Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that's that's definitely something that we encourage people to do, you know, that are on the fence of should I apply, should I not apply um, to our programs anyway. I think for me, because this is this is what I geek out about is find people in the industry and just have a conversation, right? Talk to them about what they love about it, what the challenges are, what, you know, what maybe was their path to, to um, technology? What, you know, was it non-traditional? Was it traditional? Did they get a four-year degree and then transition in? But I, I think just talking to people, you learn so much more about, you know, the ins and outs and the goods and bads of, of the industry and kind of what, you know, they always too have resources and things that you can do. And a lot of companies, you know, offer internal resources that they have for, for folks. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities with, with just having conversations and, and really learning from the people that are actually doing the work. So I, I love, I, I geek out about networking. Um, so I, I always encourage people to just have those conversations for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Casey? Christy kind of took mine. Of course she was. <laughs> of course she was going to take that one. But I was going to say the same thing. Like we have such an amazing community uh, that meetups are starting to get back into it. Meetups are free. Um, I have never run across a prime alum that did not want to offer their time um, because I feel like the whole prime system, everybody knew they didn't get to where they are by themselves. So they're very, they're always very happy to to talk and chat. Um, and I think what I've been doing, especially like in the hiring process is looking in um, non-traditional locations. So like looking on Twitter, like I'm trying to, I find people on Twitter, ask them to apply, like digging through LinkedIn, checking all of my uh, connections and the connections, like the second round and the third, you know, realm. Um, and just just really reaching out and, and asking people what the process is. And I think my last little piece of advice would just be don't count yourself out. If you're not a computer person, that doesn't mean that you can't be in the tech industry. There are so many other roles that don't involve coding, but also coding itself 
you don't have to be a super techie person. I'm very low tech. Like I still don't know what a big image is and like what a small image is like size wise. And I work in this industry and someone was like, oh, it's like this many megabytes. And I'm just like, I don't even know if that's big or not. <laughs> but I get to solve logic problems in a second language. That's how I think of it. And so if you're not a techie person, like don't count yourself out and give it a try because it's a really fantastic industry to be a part of. Awesome. Okay, Garth, you get the last word. What's a great piece of advice after all these years and now in this role? Just do it. Just do it. That's great. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate all of you. Um, you know, again, you guys give me a lot of hope that we're going to make an economy that works for everyone here. And we need to do that to, you know, to be a more equitable place for people to live and work. So appreciate all of you. Um, next, we're going to transition for those of you who can stay on. We are, um, thanks for being here for those who have to hop off. I know schedules are tight, but for those who just this, this conversation was stimulating, like it was for me, um, you know, we can stay on for another half hour for more of a casual conversation. You can either ask more questions. We can use this time to share resources with each other. Um, I'm going to turn that time over to Kosar Mohammed, who's the project manager for the city of St. Paul and serves on the tech committee of our workforce board. Kosar will help facilitate this time and also introduce um, one of uh, Prime's alums to be able to share a little bit more about their experiences and pathway as well. So Kosar, thank you for taking this last half hour for me. Thank you so much, Ling. My name is Kosar Mohammed. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I currently serve as a project manager with the MSP Tech Hire Program at the City of St. Paul's Planning and Economic Development Department. The MSP Tech Hire Program is a really robust tech talent initiative to provide scholarships to folks who are under historically underrepresented in tech. Uh, so we're really honing in on and focusing on really bringing in a diverse pipeline of individuals to be trained up and to work with our current uh, tech talent program providers and trainers such as Prime Digital Academy me, Software Guild and creating IT futures. So I'm really happy today to be able to, you know, be representing the MSP Tech Hire Program and Full Stack Initiative. Um, would really encourage you all to sign up to our for our newsletter where we share various different resources related to the Full Stack Initiative. Uh, we're really focused on people, places, and promotions. So supporting events within the tech ecosystem, supporting people within the tech ecosystem, and then really promoting various opportunities within the sector. Um, but I'm very glad today to be able to introduce Mary Matil, who is an alum from the Prime Digital Academy. Um, really great to be able to share this moment with you today and hear your experience about training up with Prime Digital Academy, um, graduating from the program, and then being able to embark in a career within tech. Um, would really be excited to share this time with you and hear about your pathway into tech, um, your overall experience at Prime Digital Academy, and then post-training, uh, how that process went for you. So opening up the floor to Mary. Hello, hello. Again, my name is Mary. Uh, she, they for pronouns. Uh, let's dive in and talk about things. Uh, so I came from a background completely not in tech. Uh, I had uh, majored in American Sign Language and, and Linguistics in college. Uh, and post-college, I really didn't know what I was going to do with that three, uh, four-year degree. Um, I got into leasing and then the pandemic hit. And then suddenly my, what should have been like a Fifty, sixty thousand dollar a year uh, salary turned into close to about forty. Um, I was taking out a lot of credit card debt just to try to feed my family. I have tiny humans at home, uh, and it was just it was really bad, um, like it was for a lot of us in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I knew a Prime alum actually that went through Prime, uh, and she had absolutely no experience in tech uh, prior to joining the program. And I was like, hmm, I'm interested to see what comes of you because she had not knew nothing code wise. Uh, so I was like, hmm, uh, okay, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on you. Uh, she graduated and proceeded to get like four or five offers in like the 70,000 range. And I was like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. Uh, so within 24 hours, I applied to Prime. Next week, I uh, had my admission interview and then I accepted a role, uh, my uh, spot in my cohort like the week after that. Um, my experience with Prime, uh, as far as the training was 
it worked so well uh, for the way that my brain works. Um, the full-time um, immersive education was really like the best way to do it. Um, Cause not only do you learn new concepts like right away in the morning, but then every afternoon you have like three or four different assignments to like practice the thing that you've just learned. Uh, so it's like all of that, like if you're familiar with linguistics, you, you don't just like sit down and read a textbooks and then suddenly you know the language you have to repetitively over and over and over and like really repeat that um understanding uh and prime gives you so much opportunity to very incrementally like okay we're gonna we're gonna stretch your understanding just a little bit and then i want you to try harder and then i want you to try a little harder and then when you're like at the point of i don't think i can do this anymore they have a lecture on exactly that subject which is like that the way that they set up the program is like it's flawless in my opinion uh so did the whole program that was really fun uh post graduation i did get a couple of different job offers which is really great uh i went from prior to prime being in like the 40 thousand ish range to getting a job offer at 72, which is like, yay, awesome. Uh, I work at a company called Hiring Thing. Uh, we work uh, for an application tracking software. So if you you as a company are looking to hire people, you use my software. I work on um, the front end, which really just means anything that you physically see on the computer screen, I work on it, uh, as well as like kind of hybrid in UX and design because who doesn't like making pretty things? So that's an amazing background, Mary. Um, I think oftentimes we hear about really unique stories whenever I at least get to connect with folks from the beginning, right, where they're interested in a scholarship and they've heard of Prime. But I think hearing from your experience, have you connected with a friend, trying to kind of look at it as, how is this program going to end up for her? Is it going to be a success? And then should I take, you know, the opportunity to dive into that? Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to briefly ask you, did you work with an employment counselor or a workforce counselor? I know Christy is on the team over there at Prime. You know, at what point during your training were you able to, you know, connect with someone within either Prime's, um, you know, sphere of employment and workforce counseling or, you know, career exploration? Or, you know, was it something once you're completed with the program and you're at the like the last leg that you were then getting some of those supports? You know, what did that overall journey look like? So Christy is really awesome at what she does. Everyone listen to Christy. Uh, so what Christy does on her end at Prime is she has a bunch of um, like built in lectures that is actually built into the curriculum of Prime, which is really cool because it's not just you're going to sit down and you're going to lo learn how to code for eight hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, it is actually um, like you learn coding, but then you learn quote soft skills like Casey was saying earlier. So you learn networking skills, you learn how, how to apply to jobs because it's not just go to indeed.com and click the button. There's like, there's better ways to do it. Um, and Christy talks about all those things. So um, the first, once you hit something called tier two, which is like the second portion, like where the full-time program starts, um, every Thursday, you get to start off your morning with coffee and Christy, where she and Bellamy uh, is another really awesome person that's there. Uh, we all like get together and we do lectures on networking or job prospecting or how to find a job or what kind of jobs are out there for junior tech people, um, all of those things. So I really relied on a lot of Christy for how to do the things. Uh, and then once Christy gave the thumbs up, I just started applying to places. Um, I figured that if I couldn't do it alone, I'd probably try to connect with Minneapolis or St. Paul for like more formal job boards. But I just like, I'm just gonna go do things. And if it doesn't work, then I can talk about more people. I love that. I love that. You know, are there particular tools that assisted you during that, you know, either during your tra tech training process or during your, you know, job seeking journey? Are there particular tools that you might have utilized, whether it's, you know, internal networks or, you know, actual tech tools that you might have, you know, put into that process of you, you know, going through both journeys? A uh, big one for me was LinkedIn. Um, I feel like there's a lot of learning through osmosis that can happen on LinkedIn, uh, even if you're not actively posting. If you have people that are in tech, you can, you know, they're connected to other people. So you uh, can read what their experience was as far as like 
interviews and what questions were asked. And as those things very slowly came up, I would just say, Ooh, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer of that. I'm going to copy, I'm going to paste that. And I'm going to put that in this document here. And I'm going to study that for later. Cause if someone asked me that question, I want to be able to know some type of scripted answer. Uh, so I would do a lot of those, um, in my past. I mean, I worked in restaurants, I've worked in coffee shops. I'm familiar with like the more personality questions. Uh, so I just, wrote down all of the personality questions and then really like tried to write a story based off of how to orient myself in a tech space from like why a barista is the best person to be a tech person. So I just like really took my time to think of all those personality questions. Like what are your top strengths? What are your greatest weaknesses? And really like craft a story and craft a narrative based off of my non-traditional tech background and why I would make a good tech candidate. I'm glad that you bring up that piece around your non-traditional background. Um, you know, one, is there any advice or recommendations you would provide to like employers or employment counselors or trainers in regards to when you're working with a non-traditional, you know, tech, you know, alum that's just coming out of a graduate program, are there particular recommendations or advice you would provide, uh, you know, to those folks who are really having those, you know, one on one sessions with them or are going through the hiring process or, you know, are working with them as they start seeking for, you know, job opportunities? Are there any recommendations you would have from your particular experience or what you're hearing uh, from other peers within the program or even other spheres? Mm -hmm. uh, biggest one that I would just say is definitely don't cut them short. Uh, we as non-traditional -trad background people have a lot of things to bring to the table and it may not be a CS degree, but we have a lot of different skills that you wouldn't traditionally think are tech related. Uh, I One of a close mentee of mine after I graduated the program was a chef and had been a chef for like 10 years. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't think a chef would directly translate to tech oriented spaces. Guess what chefs do? They manage projects. Uh, they take a thing called a restaurant and they manage every single aspect of the food there. That is exactly what a project manager does, but just in a tech space. And if you understand project management, you understand a tech flow. You understand that first you got to do this, then you got to do this, then you got to do this. Um, so maybe dumb down the vocabulary and really just talk about the process that you have at your company. And believe me, people will be able to say, oh, that relates very directly to when I was a chef or when I was a receptionist or whatever the story is. That's great. And, you know, I have one last question before I open up the floor for other folks to maybe ask Mary some questions of their own. Um, you know, how would you best, you know, advise someone to prepare for such a journey and getting into a tech boot camp or, you know, even post graduating from a tech boot camp and looking for jobs? Are there particular things that you've noted that were a success for you or other areas that might have been a challenge? But, you know, what advice or re re what recommendations would you provide within those spaces? Totally. Um, so for the first part, was there anything that I would recommend as you're trying to get into tech? So big thing on that is what are you passionate about? What do you like? Uh, so for me, I'm a very creative person. I like to design things. I like to make things. Um, I'm a crafter. I knit and I crochet and I hand sew. I like to do that kind of crafty things. So it's like, okay, when I'm looking at code, because I don't know what those squiggly lines on the computer screen look like, I don't know what they're doing. Um, how can I take my crafty and how can I put that into this tech space? And how can I make a passion out of what I am doing there. Um, so for me, it was like, ooh, I can learn how to do CSS. I can learn how to really like make complicated, cool things and just play. Uh, because there are so many studies that talk about when you're learning a new language or learning a new concept, you just gotta get playful, get curious, get playful, try new things. So if you're thinking that a career in tech might be your thing and you're thinking coding, cool, go play. Just, there are so many online resources. W3Schools is one of them. Udemy.com has a bunch of like cheaper, like in the 15 to $20 range. Sometimes they have sales and they just actually have free courses if you want to go for that round. Um, and then you can like take uh, courses that aren't 
as like high intensive as prime, but can like start to teach you the basics of HTML or CSS, or just start Googling. Like half of my job is to like Google stuff. How do I center a button on a screen? That 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 is a thing that I Googled yesterday. Uh, so just start Googling, start playing. And eventually like as you're Googling and playing, you'll read, you'll try, you'll learn through that process. Um, the second part of the question was what again? Uh, as you're looking into maybe post employment, you know, post um, graduation opportunities, and you're trying to enter that opportunity to start looking for jobs, and you're a job seeker, you know, what are some resources even outside of maybe LinkedIn or advice or recommendations you would have in that space as well? Uh, be who you are. Mm. Don't, I feel like there is a big like whenever you are going from a retail space or a restaurant space into a tech space, there is, there's this idea that tech space is suits, it's high tech, it's very fancy and you have to use big language and you have to be professional and you have to embody whatever professional means. Um, I don't prescribe to that because I, that I never, I never thrived in that space. So um, find who you are. I know that's a really easy thing to do. Really <laughs> find who you are. Advice, take that away today. Um, wow, that, write that down, okay? Um, so do that and then take that personality and bring it to your interviews. Like how I am talking to you now with the gestures and the loud voices and the not very professional, like high English. This is how I talk to every single hiring manager because I'm going to work with you. You are going to talk to me every single day. Uh, you need to know that this is the energy that I will bring every day. Um, I may not cuss in a uh, every day, but I did drop a few cuss words while I was interviewing someone because that's just, that's, that's me. And if I have to put on a mask and pretend to be someone that I'm really not, um, it's not the right place for me. So that, that's something that I, that it was, I have found to be unique in my own job thing. Uh, so take that with what you will. So much self-reflection, maybe doing a personal inventory and then yeah. seeing, you know, what is the best match in that sense? Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I want to open up the floor to the, our guests and our various different attendees that are here today and, you know, open up, see what questions folks may have. Hello. Hi. Is, hello. Hello. My name is Venice Gerald. I've been on board this digital wave of communication as of 8.30 this morning. And I understand the reason why you are having this Zoom meeting based on trying to expand St. Paul, Minnesota network topology and landscape and all digital combining aspect of business and technology. What I'm trying to gain access to is how do you transform students like myself, post-graduates, who are faced with this critical milestone in the application hiring process. When a company such as the companies that actually exhibit on display for the Zoom meeting and the panelists that spoke earlier, when a candidate like myself, an applicant is in face-to-face -face communication for a possible job opening, and they look at the gap in application employment, not just because of COVID, but maybe because of other loopholes from the past. And then they scale that back. And then they look at work history coming out of your graduate program. They say, well, where is your five or eight years experience? Where is your three year experience? Uh, that is the gap and the bridge, and that is a red flag. So I'm thinking out, uh, how do your program bridge the gap to help applicants who may not attend 
your actual boot camp program or have gone to sophisticated colleges like the U of M. I am from Keller Graduate School of Management and DeVry University is not a well-known name when it comes to matching up with U of M in my present location here in Minnesota. And I find like a lot of companies are so busy trying to plug into everything that's listed under some highlighted name of a school that's supposed to be uh, number one, number two, number three, number four in the list of, of listings. And I think that I get what your program is offering. I just want to find out where is the platform, where is the actual network co connection for people who are past the boot camp experience, who are past the internship experience, who are past all the, or rather have completed all the academia tours. And people just need to re-enter into the work program, use all of their computer certificates like myself and just make themselves remarketable or rebrand themselves or, or create a, a, a new image of themselves. And I will let you see a company extend a platform because I think it's a much needed aspect because I personally believe that your platform, your needs could only cover a certain percentage, and then that demand will lag because the supply has not been fully met because there's other people in that inner circle, in that mesh, who is not at the threshold of your bootcamp programs or your training programs or your look to hire programs. You know, we are just people who are centralized outside of that, who want to be actually centralized inside of that program as well. Thank you so much for all of that information about your background, about your needs, Venice. Um, even recognizing that, you know, maybe not everyone on this call has that particular program or service, but I will note if you can drop your email within the chat, um, there might be some partners I'm aware of that might provide workforce supports as it relates to, you know, revamping your resume, as it relates to doing that, you know, postgraduate training opportunities. And, you know, if there are other folks on this call who may see that you may have services within your organization to support Venice. Um, and once they share their email on the chat, peel, please feel free to connect with him um, and share those resources and opportunities um, because I would, you know, I would love to find that opportunity for you. Um, although within the city of St. Paul in our MSP Tech Hire program, we are for the early half of folks, um, you know, trying to get folks trained up, but there is that gap, right? Once someone does end with that training, and you know the particular program or if you did a more uh, non-traditional training where it's like self-taught um, it might be a little bit more difficult to find job opportunities as well um, so if there's anyone even on this call that may have resources feel free to jump in thank you yeah i think what venice is this is tony Siba here um from the monk knight foundation i think he's it sounds like he's frustrated he's done some education he has some boot camp experience he he's gone through probably a, a four-year degree and and there's a gap in his resume and that's not allowing him to get the job that he's looking for is that correct venice yeah i want to uh actually reintroduce myself I'm Venice Gerald. My pronouns are universal, but I am of the feminine principle and of the feminine energy, but I'm also uh, energy in transit that's plugging into every fuel station, whether it is a gender station, a transgender station, or a station without any identifications or unique identifiers, because I personally don't believe in personal pronouns. Thank you. Thank you, Venice. Okay. 
in Venice, there seems to be some folks in the chat that are already sharing their emails. I see Christy was able to share their email. I also see that Rachel Speck was able to share their email. So definitely would recommend you connect with those folks and please, please, please add your email into the chat yeah. so we can connect you up to other resources that we might be aware of. Um, but if you know if there are not if there aren't other questions, I will open it up to other folks uh, to maybe ask uh, Mary some questions. Go right ahead. I'm inserting that information as you Sounds speak. Good. Thank Thanks, you. Dennis. Just a quick, 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 quick note on um, some of the stuff that Venice was talking about. Um, I am a huge firm believer that there there is a story for everyone um and christy talks about this in uh her networking program um and how you craft your resume and stuff uh, there is a story for everyone and it is a story that you can craft and manipulate and turn into a um story of where you were and how you are here and all the things that go in the in between and really can still advocate for why you would be the best candidate um and like reach out to christy she knows what she's talking about thanks mary um and i see that we're four minutes be, um, four minutes left into this conversation just want to double check and see if there's more questions um or if there's other folks that would like to share opportunities or resources in the chat. All right, if there aren't further questions or uh, resources or other pieces and elements that folks would like to share, um, I think we can wrap up four minutes, well, three minutes early now. Uh, I see some folks are sharing their LinkedIn uh, channels as well. So if you'd like to do that to connect, uh, that would be great. But thank you all so much for being able to attend today's session. It's been a pleasure being able to hear all of your stories um, and hear all the various uh, things that you guys are doing within our ecosystem. Uh, please definitely feel free to follow our full stack um, initiative, follow the work of Ramsey County, the St. Paul Chamber, and the Workforce Innovation Board. Uh, it's been great having you all this morning. Take care.